Nuclear power was essentially started in 1945, which was an outgrowth of the Manhattan Project in the United States, which of course was war driven and weapons driven. And one of the people who was involved in that, Enrico Fermi, who was a professor at the University of Chicago, decided that nuclear physics was far too important to be wasted on weapons. So he built an experimental reactor pile. It delivered, I think, as much about as much as a double A battery at the time. You know, it was a it was a it was a physics experiment. And gradually a number of experimental reactors began to grow up all over the place. Nobody at that time knew about the risks and the nature of radiation. It was like back in the times when they discovered radium, when you know people like the Curies were tossing it around in the lab and sort of you know holding it in their hands. And then of course they all started to die off of various types of malignancies, and gradually they figured out that this wasn't a wise thing to do. And I think in the same vein, that's how people discovered how to handle nuclear materials and how to handle nuclear power and how not to. So there were a certain amount of accidents in the early sort of nuclear days. They knew how to avoid nuclear explosions because that was where the program grew up from. It grew up from the Manhattan Project and they paid a lot of attention how to cause them. And so they figured out how not to cause them in so doing. But they didn't quite know how to optimize them to generate power. So they had basically three types of accidents. The first type of accident was what happened when you didn't keep things cool. Because when... If you take a piece of uranium, if I took a slug of uranium right now, a piece of natural uranium, I could walk around with it in my pocket for days and not suffer any effects, because it's not very radioactive. Um, it's supposed to be anaphylactic, for emission, which means that if I wrapped it in paper, it wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, if I took that radiation, if I took that piece of uranium and put it into a reactor, and, and it underwent fission, it's a totally different story, because now I've turned it into different materials. I've split it in two, and I've started to produce materials like the usual suspects, cesium-137, iodine-131, strontium-90, and you know, there's a couple of other things I could add to the cocktail, uh, maybe some xenon, some krypton, um, you know, there's lots of things that come out. Cesium is bad because it tends to be ingested generally, and it's an alpha emitter, and it will, it will do the kind of damage that I told you would happen if you swallowed some of these things. Iodine is bad, it's a beta emitter, but it gets concentrated in the pyroid gland, because it replaces the natural ion which is not radioactive. Strontium is similar chemically to calcium, so it tends to get absorbed in the bone, and then it kills the bone marrow, which is also not good for you. Um, so these are the sort of the major fragments that come out of fish, and somehow that piece of uranium, which was safe initially, has suddenly been turned into these things that are not at all safe and have to be avoided. Uh, xenon, on the other hand, is very safe. It's a chemically inert gas. They even use it in, in lung scans if you go in to get a lung. Uh, function testing will make you breathe some radioactive xenon, then it'll look at where the, rays, where the radiation is coming out from. That's got a very short half life and it doesn't stay in the body, so once you breathe out, you're basically fine. But uh, Krypton is the same. In fact, Three Mile Island, these were the major things that were released, apart from some hot reactor coolants, radioactive water that had been turned into heavy water by neutron radiation. And Three Mile Island was essentially a, a nothing event except that it showed up a great deal of the weak points of the reactor training and instrumentation. I'll talk a little bit about Three Mile Island in a minute, but I just wanted to emphasize the fact that early on in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, there were little things here and there. People generally uh, had a problem with either too much radiation, because they, they reached what we call a criticality situation. It won't explode, but you can get a very strong <coughs> flare, what we call a fizzle, huge amount of radiation all of a sudden and then people get overexposed. So that was the first type of thing that they, they found, and they quickly learned not to do that. Um, they got, they, I mean, maybe a dozen people were killed in that sort of accident over the, over the three decades. Um, then you got a different type of accident, because if you look at the type of nuclear reactor that we're dealing with, it is like a kettle. It's a, it's a pressure vessel containing steam. The steam is heated by the radioactive decay, by essentially the nuclear fission, of the uranium. These are little rods of, re of, of uranium oxide, and there's some control rods inserted in between them to keep control of the neutron flux and the neutron energy. And the whole thing is surrounded by something called a moderator, which is something to slow down the neutrons. The best moderator by far, believe it or not, is water. Um, the Russians use a lot of graphite, which is problematic, as I'll talk about in a minute if we have time. Um, but this is basically a big kettle, and you're, what you're doing is producing steam, and you're putting that steam out to drive a turbine, and then it comes back as condensate as water, so you filter it and you recirculate it. And you have another 
uh, coolant circuit to keep the whole thing cool because there's huge amounts of heat being generated here. Even a tiny amount of nuclear fuel can produce more, more heat than, you know, hundreds of tons of coal. So there's a huge amount of heat density. And most of the problems of nuclear reactors, most of the, the secrets or the protocols for operating them, is basically, number one, managing the neutrons, making sure they go where they're supposed to go with the correct energy to sustain the reaction or to shut it down if it comes to that. And the second one is managing the heat, making sure that the heat comes out of this to drive the turbine. It doesn't go on, you know, blowing the lid of the vessel off, which can happen if you're not careful. So really, it's a job of, it's a job of engineering to keep these things going. And that's why you get these large sort of cooling towers to get rid of the excess heat. The, the heat of the, of the full steam essentially goes up and goes up into the atmosphere. But there's no radiation coming up into the atmosphere. It's simply the heat of the steam in the secondary circuit. The trouble with these things, however, is that they involve human beings. And human beings, and especially when they work for companies driven by profit, they tend to do things that are very short-term and very much against their ultimate interests. And one of the things that they do, of course, is that they don't spend enough time concentrating on the job. They talk about their homes or their money or their girlfriends or boyfriends or their, you know, sports teams or whatever, instead of keeping their eye on the gauges and keeping, uh, keeping watch on what they're supposed to be watching. And of course, you know, we can't begrudge, we can't expect people to be on all the time, although I believe that robotics should solve a lot of that problem. But basically what happens with these things is if the reactor design is not stable, if it's not controllable, things can go bad very suddenly. And then if people aren't focused on the job, things can get very much worse. Most of the American designs, including the one at Three Mile Island, it's a boiling water reactor. It has water as the, as the moderator. The beautiful thing about that is if something happens, the water begins to boil, the moderator goes away. If the moderator goes away, the reaction stops. There's absolutely no way for one of these things to go supercritical. There is no way for one of these things to explode in a nuclear fashion, in a boom. It can go bang, however. You can get a steam explosion or a chemical explosion, or you can generate hydrogen off the rods, and then that can explode. And that's bad. But it's certainly not nearly as bad as the, the type of thing that can happen with graphite modulators, which is what the Russians used, and which the Chernobyl reactor in Ukraine used. Um, but essentially, these are kettles. You just have to watch them and make sure they don't boil over. This is a slightly more intricate version of the engineering involved. And there is a lot of engineering, a lot of material science, a lot of corrosion studies. You have to be really careful because there's a huge amount of neutrons flowing in these things. And neutrons change things. They make materials brittle. They make them swell. They make them change chemically. And you have to be ready for that. Control rods are very important. These are rods made of things like boron, which absorb neutrons. They're a neutron poison or a neutron absorber. And whenever anything goes wrong, there's what we call a scram, a very sudden shut down, these things drop into the reactor, immediately absorb all the neutron flux, and then the, nu the, the nuclear reaction stops dead. But just because the nuclear reaction stops doesn't mean the heat stops being generated. There's still a huge amount of heat being generated. Part of it is because of the residue, and part of it is because of the decay heat, because these things are still undergoing slow fission. And that decay heat can go on for months or even years. And that's what has to be managed when the reactor is shut off, and that's what they're having such problems with in Fukushima right now, because they didn't design their cooling systems properly. So, it, it's engineering, and, and some people engineer these things better than others. And the American designs tended to be, at least the ones that Westinghouse and, and General Electric produced, tended to be like these kind, of, these kind of steam kettles, these boiling water reactors. The Russians used graphite because they weren't very good at boiling water engineering. And, um, well, this is what Three Mile Island ended up looking like. You've got a molten slag down at the bottom because everything got too hot. Three Mile Island, by the way, was this confluence of three or four things, each of which should never have happened. You had initially, they were messing with, actually I shouldn't say they were messing with, they were performing maintenance on the secondary circuits. The secondary circuit is where the steam circulates outside the reactor, so it never touches the core, it never gets radioactive, but it's used to take away the heat from the primary circuit, which is the steam that does go through the reactor. There's a heat exchanger there. And this has to be kept very clean, because you can't have corrosion, you can't have impurities, you can't get the price clogged up. So they have condensate filters, and these have to be maintained and cleaned and polished every now and again to make sure nothing happens. And they did this, and as they started doing it, the pumps, there was a time the secondary water shut down. Nobody knows why they shut down, they just went, went out. At that point, the pressure, or the temperature, and then therefore the pressure in the primary circuit started to go up. But there's a set of auxiliary pumps that should kick in. The auxiliary pumps kicked in, but someone had valved them out. In other words, they had closed all the valves and the pumps, 
so that even though the pumps were running, they couldn't actually push any water through the system. But this was a very, very bad thing to do. You're not ever supposed to valve out all the auxiliary pumps when the reactor is running, because it means you have no backup system at that point. But they did it, and the NRC fried them later for it. They, they should never have done that. So this is the second thing that went wrong. The first thing that went wrong was the pumps. The second thing that went wrong was the, the auxiliary pump valves had been improperly set. And then the third thing that went wrong, there's a relief valve near the top of the reactor. But when the pressure inside builds up to too high a level, it opens up and vents so that this thing doesn't actually explode. And that opened, but then when the excess pressure has been vented, it should close again. And it never closed again. It's stuck in the open position. And the guys who were operating the reactor were not... Let's just say they weren't the first team. They weren't the best trained. They weren't the best motivated. They were working in the middle of the night. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning when this happened. And they didn't know what was going on. They didn't recognize that the valve had stuck open. They saw the temperature going up, so they decided to put in more water, which if you thought that was going on, was probably the right thing to do. But they didn't realize that the valve was open. So they put in more water, and of course the water all started pouring out through the open valve. If they had shut the valve, the more water would have gone in, it would have cooled everything down, and nobody would ever have heard of Mile Island, because it would, have been, it would have been under control. But this went on for about 16 hours. This went on for the whole duration of these people's shift. And then a new shift came in, saw what was going on, immediately diagnosed the problem correctly, and closed the valve so that the water could actually circulate around the reactor instead of just going out the open valve. But by that time it was too late, because the temperature had already risen, the fuel rods had already buckled, the control rods had already fused into the, into the mechanism, and basically the reactor was dead at that point. No, it was dead, but at the same time, all that had happened was they had vented out 40,000 gallons of coolant water, which wasn't highly radioactive because it didn't spend a lot of time inside the reactor. And they had vented a lot of what turned out to be mildly radioactive steam containing these gases, which, as I pointed out, are the least dangerous of all. I mean, if it had released a lot of this stuff, that Chernobyl did. Very different story. But none of that stuff got out. It was all the gases that, that were vented out and the water. Well, at that point... There was a movie showing in the United States called The China Syndrome. And movies, let's face it, movies bear as much resemblance to reality as military music does to music. I mean, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. I mean, they're fine, they're entertaining. You know, they don't, they don't tell things as they are. And the, the, the premise of this China Syndrome was that a reactor would undergo one of these lots of coolant accidents and would literally burn down, going all the way through the Earth's crust and end up in China. I don't have to tell you that doesn't happen, at least I hope it doesn't, because right now the Chinese are building one nuclear power plant every three months. So if anything, the stuff will be coming the other way. <laughs> but it doesn't happen, that's, that's physically impossible. In fact, for most of these things, the pressure vessel of the reactor containment system works exactly as designed as it did in this case. The only problem is because the people were asleep at the switch, they didn't realize that they were venting both uh, water and, and radioactive gas. But nobody was killed. There's been no excess mortality, no excess cases of cancer, as far as anyone can determine. But what happened? Right about Chernobyl, I'm oh, sorry, right about Three Nile Island, 1979, the Americans quit building reactors. There has not been a single reactor commissioned in the United States since 1979. Because everybody went, Ooh, we're doomed. And yet nobody died. Nothing happened. Okay, the power company. Metropolitan Edison lost a huge amount of money because they spent billions building one of these reactors and they went and cooked it, they went and broke it. And so, you know, it wasn't particularly good for their shareholders. I'm sure some of their employees lost their jobs and, you know, the image of Homer Simpson with the, the little slug of uranium in his, in his pincers comes to mind. But the damage it did to the US nuclear industry was immense and it was all psychological. None of it was based on fact or any kind of dispassionate analysis of the risks. It was just, oh my god, the dangerous job is too dangerous. And of course, what did they do? They started building coal fired power plants instead, which were many times worse. And they took the, they stopped designing, what's even worse, they stopped designing new reactors. GE and Westinghouse, the two, two at that time, two of the biggest uh, reactor manufacturers in the world, they shipped, I mean, the stuff that they used in, in Fukushima this year, 2011, was based on the same old Westinghouse boiling water reactor designs, which were basically dating from the 60s. Imagine if you were driving a 1960s car. 
That are very cool, they look great, but in terms of safety, forget it. And they're death traps. These things were the equivalent. Roughly speaking, if any of the modern safety systems had been had, been, had existed in Fukushima, that, that accident probably would not have happened, despite a 9.0 earthquake and a 15 meter tsunami. But that's another story. Anyway, they stopped building. Then what happened? Everything's fine for a couple of years. Small time stuff, a bit of sort of fuel handling and reprocessing accidents. There was one in Germany, one in Switzerland, one in the UK and Scotland. But very small stuff. Nobody killed, nobody injured. You know, nobody, nothing worth getting upset about. And then came Chernobyl. Chernobyl is hard to describe without getting emotional, if you're anyway involved in nuclear physics or engineering. It is the worst, the most unforgivable, the most sloppy, the most base, the most vile. It was a combination of five or six different things, none of which should ever have happened. First of all, they had this design. This is what they call the RBMK design, the classic Soviet design at the time. Now, the Soviet Union had had plenty of nuclear accidents, but they never told anybody about them. And, you know, their population was considered expendable anyway, so unless you actually saw a huge sort of nuclear plume coming up, you never knew what was going on inside that, that benighted country. But their designs focused around graphite. And graphite is a terrible idea for two reasons. At least two reasons. First reason being that it's always there. You want the moderator to be there when the reaction is going. You want the moderator to be gone when the reactor is wants to shut down. Graphite is basically carbon. It's like pencil lead. It's like it's solid material. It's there whether you like it or not. So the only way of controlling this reaction is with the control rods, these boron or, or uh, essentially reaction poisoners, when you put them in so as to stop the reaction. But it takes a long time. It can take 20 seconds to roll these things down. And in the case of the Russians, it took a lot longer than that because they did lousy control rods. They did very bad control rods with graphite tips so that initially when you put them in, they actually increase the reaction. And then only when they were all the way down did the reaction start to decrease. So graphite is a lousy idea for that reason, because you can't get rid of it when you need to. Unlike water, all you can do is stop pumping it or it flashes to steam and then it's gone. The second reason it's a lousy idea, if anything goes, does go wrong, it starts to burn. It's carbon, it's like coal. It starts to burn, and not only does it start to burn, but it breaks into tiny little particles of soot, like the finest dust that would blow all over the world because they'd be carried along by the winds. There's not a lot of gravity to pull them down. They just get blown on the, on, the, on the trade winds. And so anything that happens is going to end up dispersing everywhere. I mean, water water is not ideal in some sense because in, in Fukushima, for example, right now, there's, they're having to pour water continuously from outside because they didn't design their, their close systems properly. And that water, of course, floods over, and it's radioactive. It's not hugely radioactive, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit hot. And it goes out to the sea. And, of course, it's diluted by being in the sea, but it's better that you not put the stuff into the sea, because, like I said at the beginning, you own it. That's your radioactivity. What are you doing pouring it into the sea? You should be keeping it. You should be keeping it within the reactor vessel. Um, but water, at least, doesn't go spewing all over the world. Okay, the currents will carry some of it, and... They can pick up, because they have such exquisite sensitivity in nuclear detectors, you can pick up a little tiny little uptick in California, and then people in California start going, oh, we're dead. <laughs> Despite the fact that, you know, they're, well, let's say they're living with a lot more risk from earthquakes than they are from, from stuff in, from, from Fukushima. But graphite actually does go around the world. I mean, when Chernobyl went off, it coated all of Western Europe and a lot of the Eastern Soviet Union with, with this radioactive, and this is not just your ordinary radioactivity, this is cooling water. This is part of the core itself. This is the most radioactive stuff. If you were standing next to this, you would get a fatal dose in about two seconds. You're talking about thousands of millisieverts per minute. And, and literally, right next to the core, you're probably talking about tens of sieverts per minute. So you'd be getting, yeah, you, 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 ten seconds you'd be cooked. And this stuff is going up. And of course, the Russians didn't believe in building containment vessels or sarcophaguses, you know, these big... Uh, Concrete domes over the top. So whatever came out of the core just went up in the sky. But the first thing they did, this is an unstable design, because of the presence of the graphite and because of the bad fuel rod design. It's always ready to go up. And paradoxically, it's most unstable when you run it at low power. Because the way they designed it is that the fuel rods and the control mechanism, the pumps, 
were run by the turbines themselves. When you're running the reactor at low power, the turbines are turning slowly. They're barely kicking over. They had diesel backups, but the diesel took about a minute to kick in. And sometimes a minute is not enough. Anyway, so bad reactor design, number one. Number two, bad crew. They had a crew that was ill-trained, that was poorly paid. I'm sure if, if anything like modern Ukraine is, is, is an example to go on, probably half of them were drunk. <laughs> and I don't mean like slightly drunk, I mean paralytic. But this is the way life is there. It's a very unhealthy population. Um, the day crew, the expert crew, had designed an experiment. They were going to do a stability experiment on this, on this particular reactor. The experiment configuration called for it to run at a certain level, about 700 megawatt thermal. It was actually running about 50. So it was, it was really ready to go on stable. It was run by the night crew instead of the day crew, the people who designed the experiment. The night crew didn't really know what was going on, but they were told to do certain things, and they did them. When they did them, the reactor went unstable. An accident waiting to happen. Huge power spike. It went from about 50 megawatts to 30 gigawatts, almost a thousand fold increase in power output within a few minutes. They didn't know what to do. They tried to push the control rods in, but because the control rods had this design flaw, they had graphite tips instead of boron tips. They actually made things worse for a period of about 10 seconds. And then the, the core walked so much that they wouldn't go in any further. So they had a hot reactor, they had a huge spike in, in thermal output, they blew the lid off the thing, all the graphite, all the fuel rods, all the control rods went out basically into the night sky. Coated the whole area around it. The, the last didn't know what was going on, but they, they knew it wasn't good. So they called a fire brigade. They called the local fire service from the nearby city of Pripyat. Now the fire brigade in Pripyat had previously had nothing to do with Chernobyl. They didn't really know what was going on in there, or groomers, of course, because of this was the Soviet Union. But they didn't know what they were dealing with. So they come up with their water, their water sprays, and their sort of normal, you know, oil skins or whatever. No radiation suits, no, none of the special foam that you would use to try and keep the graphite from blowing. Graphite actually burns stronger in the presence of water than it does simply in the presence of air. The burning of graphite is more intense when it gets hold of hydroxyl groups, and that's what water has. It's HOH, it's hydrogen hydroxide. And so things went, went worse. And of course, they were standing by hosing down this stuff that was giving them a fatal dose of radiation within 10 seconds, but it had come directly out of the core. So pretty much all the fire, the fire service, the people who were, who were uh, directly responding, were killed within a day or two. So that, that was 21 people. Um, some of the people who were reactor operators stayed behind to try and shut things down. Some of them died, and they had gotten, you know, tens of secrets. They were, they were dead from the moment they, they got that exposure. The government in the meantime, remember, this is the old Soviet Union, told nobody. They didn't evacuate. They didn't tell people not to drink the milk or eat the food. They didn't give out iodine tablets. They said nothing. So people continued ingesting the iodine, the cesium, the strontium. Worst possible case. I mean, compared to Fukushima, it's like night and day. People are comparing Fukushima to Chernobyl, and I, I, I laugh at them. I, there's absolutely nothing in common between those two accidents, except the fact that they were involving nuclear reactors. Anyway, so Chernobyl, eventually, they send in <coughs> crews to drive bulldozers and put in some boric acid, which is a, a neutron poison in the same way as the control rods are, just to make sure the thing doesn't reignite. Um, bulldozed earth, concrete sarcophagus, the whole works, which kind of shut things down and, okay, there's still nuclear material in there, but it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's not leaching into the groundwater. But, of course, the initial plume is now blowing all over the place, and they only disclosed it when a, a nuclear power station in Sweden, three days later, picked up the radiation plume traveling overhead and depositing some stuff. They thought for a, day, for a while that it was them. It was their own power station. But they knew pretty quickly that it wasn't. And you can also tell by the ratios and the sort of mixtures of these things that are coming out, you know which country and probably even which power station they came out from, because each one is different. Anyway, that's Chernobyl. Chernobyl is a monstrosity. You've never heard that. But people still think Chernobyl every time they think of a nuclear plant. Well, yes, if you're back in the old Soviet Union in the 1980s with all these with all these people and these ridiculous designs and these crazy procedures. Yes, that, that's, that's what you get. But that's nothing to do with, with modern practice. After Chernobyl, things sort of calmed down for a while. 
Um, nobody wants to build reactors after that. Um, 25 years later, by the way, you can look back at Chernobyl, the flora and the fauna have come back. They had one generation of uh, horses and deer and whatever that looked stunted, so probably because they had pyroid problems from the first go around. But the second generation was fine. No sign of birth defects, no sign of any sort of obvious problems. Um, so 25 years later, the, the nature has pretty much come back. The town of Pripyat is still deserted. Nobody wants to live there. I'm not entirely surprised. But some of this stuff is very long lived, and you, you, it's really not good for you. Um, on the other hand, the number, the number of deaths from Chernobyl, the worst possible combination of circumstances. It's hard to estimate because, as I said, this is a very unhealthy population anyway. They, they drink like crazy. They smoke like crazy. They, um, I mean, the, the median sort of life expectancy in those places is probably less than 50 years. So you certainly can't use them as a sort of normal population for cancer statistics or, or any of the sort of diseases that you would associate with radiation exposure. But a conservative estimate is that somewhere between eight and 10,000 excess cases of thyroid cancer resulted. Now that could have been nil cases of thyroid cancer if only they told people not to eat the food and drink the milk and gave them iodine tablets. But nonetheless, somewhere between eight and 10,000 cases Thyroid cancer, thankfully, is relatively treatable. The statistics are within five years, 96% of the people who get it are alive, and even up to 30 years, more than 90%. I mean, you know, most people, if they get decent medical care. No, we don't know if they got decent medical care, because this is the Ukraine. But if this happened in a Western environment, you would have more than, probably more than 95% uh, of the people would be alive having experienced thyroid cancer. So it wouldn't be ideal for them. They would have, have to go through chemotherapy and, and surgery. But nonetheless, that the odds of survival were very good. So somewhere around a twentieth of that number. So you're talking about maybe a few hundred people probably died as a result of excess uh, exposure in Chernobyl. And it's bad. You know, a few hundred people being killed is not, not good. But it's the equivalent of one airplane falling out of the sky. So it's a tragedy, but it certainly isn't the reason to shut down an entire industry and, and, and turn your face against a, a particular form of power generation. Particularly considering the millions of people who die every year as a result of, of burning fossil fuels, and then never mind mining this stuff. God knows how many people die in Chinese mines. So, nuclear power, risky, certainly. There are long term issues regarding the storage of waste that cannot be, that cannot be ignored. But when you compare it with the other things that we're doing, it pains into insignificance. You've got to know what you're doing. That's, that's the main thing. You've got to know what you're doing. You can't have amateur crews, you can't cut costs. I would go so far to say is if anyone is running nuclear power now, that it should not be a commercial company. There should be no profit motive whatsoever. It should be done by the government. And it should be done according to the strictest standards. And there is an example for that kind of thing. There is, there is a large set of data. The biggest operator of nuclear reactors in the world, by far, is the United States Navy. There are submarines, there are aircraft carriers, some of their larger sur sur surface complement warships are nuclear powered. They have never had an accident, they have never had a meltdown, even a partial one. They've never had an issue with processing or uh, reprocessing fuel, or handling fuel. And the reason is threefold. First of all, they take the very best people they can find. And in the Navy they have extremely good people. And they're selected to the highest standards, they're trained to the highest standards, and there is zero tolerance for any kind of messing around. You, you read a newspaper in, in the reactor control compartment of a submarine, you're out. You have a moment of inattention, you don't pass your tests, you're up. And that's the way it should be. When you're handling that kind of technology with the potential for, for danger and, and destruction that it holds. But these people have been, have been running reactors for 55 years. Hundreds of reactors. They, they have tens of thousands of reactor hours. The number of reactors multiplied by the number of, of uh, sorry, reactor years, by the number of years they've been operating. And they never had a casualty. So it certainly is possible to do it, but you really have to know what you're doing and you can't be compromising. Fukushima. Fukushima is basically a 1960s time accident. It's using 1960s technology. There's Fukushima right there. Six boiling water reactors. These two, by the way, were in cold storage. They were in cold shutdown. They were being maintained and upgraded, but they weren't running. They didn't even have any fuel rods inside. They didn't have any spent fuel pools like the other ones did. These were the ones that were partially up. I think four was down, but it had spent fuel in the pools. Spent fuel pools are where they put the rods. Rods are easily poisoned, okay? You put your fuel rods in, 
they don't get they don't use up all the uranium, but what happens is they accumulate various poisons like xeno that are produced in the reaction and they, they absorb neutrons, so they have to be taken out and essentially cleaned and reprocessed and then put back in again. When they're taken out first, they're very hot and the decay heat has to be allowed to diminish. So for a couple of months or perhaps even a couple of years, they go into these pools, like big swimming pools, and they're kept under water for cooling and to make sure that all the radiation escapes into the air. And that's a sort of a normal thing. So it isn't normal, as they did in Fukushima, to put the pools right on top of the damp reactors. They should be further away. They should be such that if anything happens to the reactors, it doesn't take out the spent fuel pool as well. Because there's at least as much fuel in here as there is in there. And unlike the stuff in there, this is not inside a pressure vessel. Okay? This is something that you need to really work very hard to breach. They're designed to stand huge overpressures. And certainly, you know, you, you, there's almost nothing that I can think of that would breach this sort of container unless you really, you know, went at it with delivers intent for a very long time. But these things are not kept there. And this fuel, if it if the water level drops or if it goes out in the air, the decay heat will cause it to melt and possibly cause it to go on fire. And then you'll get release of some of this material into the air and into the environment. And that's not good. Now it's not like a nuclear explosion, it's not like Chernobyl where all this stuff goes into the air. But it's certainly going to pollute the environment. And that's something to be avoided. But it's not that they shouldn't be in, in that locality. But nonetheless, what happened here is that they lost their coolant. They lost their coolant, but they only had one set of pumps. They had a backup power supply in the form of diesel generators, and then they had a battery supply, but the batteries only lasted for eight hours, which is really inconsequential. It doesn't matter and what happened there. I think I suspect they had them there just to say that they had them there, but they had a second there of redundancy, but in reality they didn't. They should have had a second set of diesel generators remotely located from the first, ready to kick in at a moment's notice. They did not. Now, in fairness to them, they had a 9 point earthquake, which took out the primary systems. The reactor continued to be on damage. It scrammed immediately, the earthquake hit, because there were seismic sensors and these things, and the control rod just dropped in and shut it down. But as I said, it's the excess heat, the decay heat that kept on bubbling away. The diesel kicked in, as they were designed to do. And the tsunami came along, but they were designed to withstand, I think, a 7 meter tsunami. They got a 15 meter tsunami. And this was a, an event that should statistically not have happened, but it did. That wiped out the diesel generators. They didn't have a second set. They should have had a second set. Why didn't they have a second set? It would have cost them at most a million, a million euros, a million dollars, to produce the kind of power and flow rate that they needed to have. And drop them in the bucket. They didn't have them. They had these batteries. Go to batteries. We need to keep the decay heat quiet for weeks, if not months. And we call it battery, it's like a joke. And that's what they have. So Fukushima was, was bad design in a sense. The reactor did what it was supposed to do. The auxiliary stuff, the cooling pumps, they were hugely inferior to the task that they had to produce, that they had to, the, the task they had to perform. So they ended up spewing out water. And some of this stuff, certainly some iodine, some cesium, maybe some strontium, it's all within 30 kilometers of the zone, or at least it was initially. They then started to suffer from hydrogen explosions, because if you're not controlling the temperature, the steam begins to build up. Steam reacts with the zirconoid cladding on the fuel rods, and it gives you zirconium oxide and hydrogen. And hydrogen, one of the reasons we don't drive our cars powered by hydrogen, even though everybody keeps asking for it, is that it's extremely dangerous. It's such a tiny molecule, it gets out from anything. You can't seal it in, just, it always finds a way of diffusing through whatever barrier you put up. And then it explodes. And one of the explosions, the three of the explosions that happened, did not breach the containment vessel that I put up there. Which is a testament to the strength of that design. The fourth one, however, did so. And that resulted in a leaking of material out into the ground, out through into the water, the other three were fine. One of the reactors is still leaking. It's leaking relatively slowly. And it probably they will be able to stem the leak eventually because the temperature is coming down and the pressure is coming down all the time. So the force that's pushing the leak is diminishing. But it's still leaking. And that shouldn't have happened. Um, but really, it shouldn't have happened because they should never have allowed the pressure to build up enough. They should never build up. The temperature should not have built up to the point where the hydrogen was generated. But that's one of the hazards if they're not... And it's all about temperature control. 
This is just a scaled up version of what you have in your central heating system at home. This is not rocket science. This is not cutting edge technology. It's pumps and pipes. It, it, it should not have happened. There are systems, I'm showing you a picture of one of them, it's in Italian, but basically it's a pebble head reactor. Instead of having all these rods and coolants circulating around by, by pumping, these things are basically like a tennis ball sized piece of material. And inside each tennis ball is a whole lot of little pellets. And these pellets are uranium, covered by graphite, so the graphite is the moderator, and then covered by something really hard and fireproof like silicon carbide. And these things, they, they come into this reactor, because of their size, they have a certain proximity to each other. That starts the reaction. Temperature goes up, it starts to... They're actually temperature sensitive. If the temperature goes up too high, it stops immediately. So that's the first thing. It can't go critical. You don't need a moderator, because each pellet has its own little bit of graphite moderator. The graphite can't go on fire, because it's covered by silicon carbide. At least it better not go on fire. And the thing is cooled by gas. You take an inert gas like helium, or krypton, or xenon, and you force cool it, and this whole thing can run at 1,500, 2,000 degrees Celsius, whatever the containment vessel can support. There's no coolant, there's no pumps. This thing is passively cooled. So it can't run away permanently. The neutron management is arranged simply by the fact that these things can't get closer to each other than a certain, basically by the diameter of the sphere. And there... They started working on these things in the 60s, but then... At that time, they didn't have the technology to make these things properly. And so the industry abandoned it in favor of the current sort of uranium rod technology. But recently, because the rod technology is limited, because it has these safety issues, these things are coming back into force again. Now, the U.S. isn't doing much, but they used to do it at Oak Ridge Lab, which is in Tennessee, which is where they process a lot of their fuels. But they've stopped. Nowadays, most of the, re most of the work on pedal beds is being done in China, in South Africa, a little bit done in the Netherlands. The French, of course, are very much to the fore in nuclear technology because they generate 80% of their electricity using it. So they're very interested in this technology. There's a little bit of work going on in the UK. This actually is an opportunity. This type of technology, because it's totally new, it's much smaller in scale. It's inherently safe. Huge value added. Whoever gets the patents for these will make huge amounts of money. This is something that Ireland could easily become involved in if there were... But, you know, Ireland, look, we're, we're talking about tourism and food, but, you know, that's only going to get us so far. We need a new industry. We need a new, a new strength. We need something to do with food. We all have to conquer the world again. And this sort of thing, why not? You have to set your sights reasonably high. But the old nuclear technology is still, there's still a lot of it out there. There's hundreds and hundreds of power stations installed. Another type of technology which is very interesting. I won't get into the ducks and bolts of it. But... Instead of using, this is a bit more like the, the pressurized water or boiling water system, but this uses salts of uranium or thorium. Much higher temperature, like molten metals. The Russians, who did all the most risky things you can imagine, they used to put liquid sodium reactors in their submarines. Now, sodium is a very reactive metal. When you liquefy it at high temperature, it becomes even more reactive. And God forbid if it ever gets out of the reactor in salt water, because then, you know, the reaction just goes crazy. So the worst possible thing you could put in a, in a reactor in a submarine. But they did it. Because <laughs> they wanted more power. They wanted to beat the Americans, so they wanted more power. And they were building submarines at the time, which were called Victors, and then they were building Aculas, and then they were building, I think, the, um, what do they call it? I can't remember now, but one of their fastest submarines used this, this sodium open sodium reactor technology, which killed half the people who worked in the submarine, but, you know, the Soviet Union didn't care too much about that. Um, the, the American submarines, by the way, they all use pressurized water or boiling water systems, so they're all very safe. But this stuff, this stuff allows you to use thorium. Uranium is limited. You have to enrich it. It's not that abundant. Um, it has all kinds of problems, and it turns into plutonium, and if it turns into plutonium, even though someone might have a civilian nuclear reactor, suddenly they can turn around and build a bomb. Whereas normally you can tell if they're going to build a bomb because they have these enormous enrichment, enrichment plants like the Iranians have now. I mean, a bomb requires enriched uranium or plutonium. There's no other way. Uh, a civilian reactor can run quite happily on natural uranium or on different isotopes of uranium or thorium or anything like that. But if you, have, if you start with uranium, you can end up with plutonium. So if someone buys a civilian nuclear reactor or builds one, and they start off with uranium, it's only a matter of time before they end up with enough plutonium to build a bomb. 
And that's not good, especially, you know, if it's Iran or North Korea or some of the people that we don't really trust. But if you start with one of these things, you can start with thorium, then you can't end up with plutonium. You end up with uranium-233. Uranium-233 does not give you plutonium. Uranium-235 gives you plutonium. So much safer. No proliferation risks. The waste that comes out of these things decays in 100 years instead of 10,000 years. So the problems of storing it become much more tractable. You're no longer leaving it to your, you know, 10 generations since. You, at most, you have to, you know, look after it for 100 years. But most things are seism seismically stable for 100 years. So you can figure out ways and places to store the waste. Lots and lots of advantages. Now, this is not something that we could do here in Ireland because this is major engineering and this is something for which you need an established industry. But this is what the Americans should be working on. But of course they're not because the world's nuclear power has become so toxic over there. Again, the Chinese are doing it. But the Germans are doing some of it. The French are doing it. And this is probably going to be the future of nuclear reactors because the pedal bed stuff is a bit too innovative. But if we worked on pedal, pedal beds and made them, made them hot and made them trustworthy, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that we can make a difference. Anyway, I'm, I, I'm not a, an advocate of nuclear power, but neither am I a, a denier. The cost of burning fossil fuels will pretty soon become too high to pay, either the financial cost or the environmental cost. It doesn't matter whether they're biofuels or, or dug out of the ground. The, the same environment, environmental damage will result. The same health costs of breathing the particulate matter will result. And so we're going to have to change the way we think about power generation and use. Obviously, the best thing to do is if you can reduce demand, if you can, you can pay people to stop using power. It sounds like a silly thing to do, because up to now, the power companies, have, you know, we want to pay you to take our power. Well, if you consider the cost of generating power, a fossil fuel plant will generate power at something like the capital cost of the thing, not the running costs. Maybe $2,000 a kilowatt, approximately. Maybe 1500 if you're really, if you're really economical. But 2000 a kilowatt is, is pretty much normal. Right now, the cost of a safe nuclear power system, with, with all the current safeguards, is closer to 10000 That's full life cycle cost, includes the cost of decommissioning, storing the waste, etc. But it's about five times as high. So my objection to nuclear power is not so much in safety grounds, although you have to address them, it's the fact that it's so expensive. Because you have to invest in these safety technologies, otherwise don't do it. Like I said, it's your nuclear materials, those are your gamma rays, your alpha particles, don't be spilling them. If you produce them, you've got to safeguard them. And that costs a lot of money. So that would be my primary objection to nuclear power. But nonetheless, I mean, you have to keep the lights on. So you can pay people up to $10,000 a kilowatt to, to require less power, and you're ahead of the game. You're spending less than you would to build a power station to satisfy their demands. Um, having said that, there will be demands, there will be industry, there will be lights at home, there will be things that we want to do. We might even want to entertain ourselves from time to time. And roughly speaking, Ireland has a budget of about 5 gigawatts, 5,000 megawatts. You need that much capacity to give people a decent standard of living and maintain the sort of transport and, and industry that we have. And so you have to figure out how we're going to generate that, and we're not allowed to burn fossil fuels anymore. You can have a windmill on every street corner, you'd never get there. Because windmills are notoriously inefficient. Even if you specify them as a kilowatt, then you'd be lucky to get 100 watts out of them, just because of the way turbines work. Uh, wave power, likewise, you know, you, it's very hard to extract meaningful power from them. I'm not saying you don't do it. I mean, do all these things, do everything you can. Put solar panels on top of everything. Conserve wherever you can, but you're always left with a couple of gigawatts, a couple of thousand megawatts that you have to generate. If you can't burn fossil fuels, you've got to do something like this. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. And the trouble is really, it takes 20 years to build something like that. So if you're not deciding to do it now, by the time the 20 years are up and the lights are off, everybody's pointing fingers at each other, saying, you should have done this, sir. you should have told us that, no, you shouldn't. What's the point? You're out of the game. You're back in the Stone Age. You're back to prioritizing the hospitals and the, and the, the police or whatever. You know, only they get power and then the rest of us are wrapping ourselves up in God knows what. Yeah, it's just another good image. And when you see something coming, you know it's going to happen in 20 years and people are just BSing about other things all the time. It really annoys, really annoys you. Anyway, that's a separate discussion. That's a, that's a completely different thing to talk about. Radiation is bad. It is bad for you and if you get too much of it, it will kill you. Uh, the same is true of most things in life. It is not a man-made problem, it is mostly a natural problem, but if you want to generate power using any of these technologies, it becomes a man-made problem. 
in the sense that you're producing more, and it's your responsibility to manage it. Um, there have been some spectacular failures of responsibility to manage it, most notably Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl, as I've pointed out in many different ways, was an abomination. Free My Island was a tiny squib, but it had the result of scaring an entire nation, the most powerful nation on the earth, but also the most panic prone. They just decided, oh, we're never going to do any nuclear power again. And they're still not thinking straight, but at least they're beginning to go back to it, or at least they were. Barack Obama was talking about it until the Fukushima came along. The Germans were thinking similarly, very logical thinkers. They were going to extend the lifetime of their existing reactors. But then Angela Merkel, she gets hung up in Baden-Württemberg and doesn't get the vote. And she goes, ah, even though she's a physicist, we should take her card away. <laughs> <laughs> they teach us to be tougher than that. Um, the French, of course, are going their own way. The French always go their own way. And in this case, I have to admire them because they're doing it exactly right. They've invested in the technology. They have the uranium stored. They have the... Uh, they have the facilities built. When the rest of us are in the dark, the French will be living the, the beautiful life. You know? they, they will, and of course, they will sell us some if they like us, and we reduce our corporation taxes or whatever they want us to do. They give us some power. But, gosh, why can't we do what they're doing, or at least a tiny percentage of what they do? Why can't we live just one nuclear reactor, for God's sake? They wouldn't bankrupt us. Of course, we, we have no problem in buying nuclear power from anybody else. We just don't want to have anything to do with it ourselves. Anyway, I've said enough. I've probably said more than enough. Um, as you can tell, it's a complex issue. Um, there is no nuclear power or no nuclear physics or nuclear engineering program in this country. And there won't be until the government lifts this ridiculous legal restriction on having nuclear power. I mean, if you, if you compare what happened, if you look back in the 40s and 50s, when there was rural electrification and the building of Ireland Prussia, and the government turned around to the university and said, we want all these people trained for the ESB, we want you to start electrical engineering departments, go for it, and they went for it, and this is why we are where we are today. They need to do something similar. They need to turn around and say, look, in 20 years' time, this is going to be a very different world. We won't have energy, we won't be able to do this, we won't be able to do that. We need your help. And whether they choose nuclear or not, I don't care. They should have a debate where they put all the things up against each other and then try and be reasonably logical and scientific about it. And if nuclear loses, well, so what? I mean, you know, there'd be something else there. But they're not even having the discussion there. They're sort of... And I, I understand why people are concerned with the immediate economic problems, but, you know, we'll get through them. This is economics. Economics is flexible. It's malleable. It's hard, but you can get through it. You can't beat the laws of physics. No amount of pleading or IMF bailouts or mm -hmm. any... You know, political shenanigans are going to change the laws of physics. You're there, and God help you. You know, there's nothing we can do. Okay. Anyway, look. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, let's have some questions and some discussion.